Well, today I'm interviewing Professor Laurie Klotz from Toronto, well-known authority on prostate cancer and a controversial producer of the Active Surveillance uh, uh, series. So, Laurie, welcome, and um, uh, it's uh, great to be talking to you. But what I want to say to you first is, if you could just maybe give us your background, where it all started, your family, etc. Well, I grew up in Toronto. Uh, my father was a urologist. Uh, his interest was mainly infertility, andrology, but I, and I also come from a long line of uh, healthcare practitioners. My grandfather on my mother's side was a physician, actually one of the first Jewish physicians to graduate from University of Toronto back around 1910, and uh, various uncles and so on. So I come from a medical family, uh, and actually I, um, in part because my father was a urologist, I didn't even dream or contemplate urology for many years. I was <clears throat> more interested in psychiatry as a medical student, started off in internal medicine for a couple so, so, of years. So you, you, your medical school was in? Medical school was in Toronto. In Toronto, so, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, so psychiatry was so your, was, so yeah. like a lot of students starting out, uh, and I had I always had broad intellectual interests. Uh, I was very interested in philosophy, and you know, psychiatry, the the relationship between the mind and the brain, and human motivation, so on, was quite interesting to me at that point. Uh, but uh, I grew out of that, I think, fortunately in many ways, and uh, started off in internal medicine, but really eventually reached the point where I thought, gee, the fact that my father's a urologist is not a good reason not to go into urology, and I was drawn to, to surgery and, and uh, very familiar with the field. And of course, there's very uh, many father-son combinations in urology amongst other specialties. <clears throat> uh, and I did a, a lot of my training was in Toronto, some was at McGill University in Montreal, and then I was a fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Which Who's, was, who was in Memorial when you were there? So I was there in the transition year between Whitmore, Whitmore's Not last fair, year yeah. and Fair's first year. It was a very interesting time to be there. And, uh, you know, I, I really had the privilege of being mentored by Whitmore, although it was in some of, not his final years of practice, but certainly his final years in a leadership position. So who was there? Who else was there? Yeah. Harry Herr, Prem Sagan, no, Bill who, Fair, who were your Morse. contemporaries? Ah. Um, the guys in my year uh, aren't that, well, let me rephrase that. The guys in my year were Jeff Huffman, Stu Rosenberg, and Joe Sloan, uh, most of whom have not uh, continued on in academic medicine. The guys the year behind were Peter Carroll, uh, Bob Stevenson, Nelson Stone, a right. uh, very well-known group of... Yes, yes, sure. So you, you, were, you, you outshone your contemporaries in Memorial. Uh, I didn't, certainly didn't feel that way at the time. <laughs> it was a very talented group of guys right. and there was a high bar and it was a matter of just running as hard as one could to stay abreast. Right. Right. Okay. So, so then, and then, eventually, you went back to Toronto and and to yes. Sunnybrook, and and you you made your way there in the, uh, of course, with the prostate cancer. But let's just let's just come back a bit. So you 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 were interested in in philosophy and psychiatry, uh -huh. and actually, I mean, you are quite a complicated individual. I I, I would certainly say that uh, there are barriers. I feel which which you may put up. I, 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 I think I'm right in saying that, but... Um, All right. Would I be right? Do you, do you agree or disagree? Uh, well, I'm not sure how to interpret that. Um, Is this another barrier I see coming up? <laughs> Let me think about that for a minute. I, I don't think I'm a particularly overly defended individual. <laughs> Everyone has their barriers. Uh, but, uh, 
One of the things I, I think maybe we can go to the next question. Yeah, let's move on <laughs> to the next question. I rather like uh, your sense of humor, um, which uh, coincides with mine, which sort of helps. Uh, uh, it, it, so I, I find that I, I laugh at, at the same sort of well, thing that you're laughing you. at. Well, thank you, yeah. But there are other things which I know you're interested in, uh, like uh, the Middle East. Yes. And uh, you mentioned your Jewish uh, background. Yes. And, uh, and I know that you have a, an interest in, in things that happen in the Middle East. Do you want to take us through that a little bit? Well, I, I grew up with a very kind of secular <coughs> background, not, not particularly observant. And uh, I also, I think, grew up in a very special time in history when uh, anti-Semitism, particularly in North America was at a historic low. And I mean, I, I grew up in a completely integrated environment and never felt really w w had the slightest issues about that. But uh, I'm certainly a very strong supporter of the state of Israel. I'm a Zionist. And clearly, as time has gone on, I think there's a rising tide of anti-Semitism around the world and uh, there's a very obviously a very strong animus against the state of Israel and a kind of international attempt to isolate it which I uh, uh, am strongly opposed to to me it's an, I mean no state is perfect but it's a it is really a Western outpost of democracy and liberalism in a very harsh neighborhood uh, so, yeah, you know, I, I would say, I mean, that certainly is a political view that I hold very closely. So do you go there often to, to Israel? I've, I've been there two or three times. Uh, we're actually organizing a conference there uh, about a year and a half from now called the Friends of Israel Symposium, which will be an opportunity, a uh, Friends of Israel Urology Symposium, right, yeah. which will bring an, uh, be an opportunity for for like-minded people to come together, right. uh, all Jews and non-Jews, and uh, have a urology conference uh, in Tel Aviv. It's the first time this kind of thing has been done, as I understand it, by any specialty, much less in urology. They have a very strong urological society there. I, I, I was guest there. I gave the Mara Melikow lecture some many years ago, and I found the What's going on there is is in urology is very strong. Um, um, people like Heim Matzkin, who I see on a on a mm -hmm. reasonably regular basis, is I think a a good example of, of of the good things that are coming out of there. Now, again, so we we've mentioned the the Jewish issue, but also I'm I'm thinking, where did your family come from originally? I mean, oh, so my parents were both born in Toronto. My grandparents were kind of born, my, my, the grandfather, the one who was, became the physician, was born in Russia, right. in Rostov, uh, essentially fled there at the age of about six years old with his mother, and they had an uncle in Toronto. And uh, the story is he actually wrote a memoir which was discovered years after his death. They, it took them about six months of arduous travel to get to Toronto where they got off the train station late on a winter's night and someone was supposed to meet them. There's no one there. Wow. And everyone disappears. They're standing there. They don't speak English. They don't know anyone else. And finally this old man who's the uncle comes up and his greeting, in greeting them he says to them, what are you doing here? We don't have room for you. You should never have come. You should go back. So that was, that was another, a, a harsher era, but wow. they flourished. And he was a very talented guy. And uh, he, he actually had a lifelong interest in history, which, some, which is where I get some of my interest in history and politics. And, uh, you know, successful career as a physician in Toronto. And then the other side <coughs> came from Eastern Europe somewhere. We're not quite sure right, where. Right. Now, why did why did they leave Russia? What was you, you said? oh uh, uh, well? There's it's a, I don't know if we've got time for that. <laughs> uh, he sent, 
It's a story, which I can tell you if you're interested. Sure, go ahead. Uh, and uh, you may or may not want to include this. The, the, the story is that the, the, the czar used to kidnap uh, young Jewish boys for, the, for his army at the age of six to eight. And they would be put in the, in the youth corps. Mostly they would never see their family again. Right. And they would, be, they would become uh, Cossacks. And uh, essentially, one of these guys who remembered where he was from came back to this to Rostov with advanced cancer, dying. And he hadn't, it had been 50 years since he'd been there. And he wanted to have a Jewish burial. And uh, this was strictly illegal to, to bury a Cossack in a Jewish cemetery. Right was totally illegal. So they did this secretly at night, and then they were blackmailed by someone in this town uh, that threatened to report them to the authorities. And that was the stimulus to, to get out. say, we're getting the hell yeah, out of here. Yeah. Enough of this. Right. OK, so uh, so interesting uh, background. And, and, and you're, you're obviously, we've talked about your urological issues, interests being um, the management of prostate cancer. We were just speaking downstairs of how you may be, in fact, vindicated in your views um, with upcoming trials, which is great. But then, it's not really that I want to talk to you about. It's it's more about your other interests. Now, we've, we've, right. we've, we've talked about philosophy. We've talked about uh, issues like that. You mentioned history, which touches a, a, yeah, well, a nerve with me, of course, as well. So, tell us about. Well, that. let me let me just say. Uh, I've always had broad interests, and I, I really have always believed in the importance of living a balanced life. Right. And so uh, I'm very, you know, physically active. I've always done sports. Uh, I played tennis early in the morning, before 6.30 a.m., a couple of times a week. Uh, ice hockey during the winter. Uh, I really, you know, try and stay fit, and I find that that's a huge stress reliever. Uh, music's <laughs> one of my hobbies. I play four instruments. The main one is piano. I'm, you know, studying it lifelong. Okay, so so music. Um, what do you play? In fact, classical music or, or mostly jazz. Mostly jazz. Yeah. So I've kind of been studying. One of my hobbies is jazz harmony. Wow. And uh, great. If I get home at the end of a long day, and I, I have a couple of books, which are it's a bit like. Uh, it's a bit like studying the Bible. You can kind of turn it to any page and sit down and yeah. work away. And so I'll you know, work on some particular chord phrasing or something just for a few minutes. Very therapeutic. Uh, so jazz and popular music. And I have some friends that I uh, jam with wow. every couple of months. Fantastic. But history. Yeah. So, well, my main interest is kind of uh, modern European history and uh, I'm in a book club which meets about every six weeks and really the focus is uh, uh, history and politics and economics and that's been a real stimulus for me to read uh, because the tendency is to read there's so much to read in the field and uh, there's no question for, for a long time that's all I did it's hard to keep up, even with a focused area of interest. But uh, uh, so, partly through this book club, which is uh, kind of like-minded individuals. Uh, so I, I, you know, read just to try and have something meaningful to say. But uh, so you know, World War II antecedents, anything going back to about 1500, I would say. Right. Uh, the best book I've read recently is called um, by Roger Crowley, um, Empire of the Seas, which is the struggle for domination in the Mediterranean in the 16th century between Suleiman the Great and Philip II and of Spain. And what you realize is how close the world came, the Western world at that time came to being completely in totally dominated by the uh, Muslim Empire. And it was a very, it, it, very close call. Right. 
And of course, later on was the siege of Vienna, which, uh, yes. which again, uh, 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 <coughs> nearly the same result. So, okay, <coughs> so we got jazz and modern European history. So neither of these are what one usually hears people talk about as being their major interests. Uh -huh. So let me now ask you who, who your heroes are. So let's take some historical ones, and then you can give me a urological one. Well, of course, uh, Winston Churchill. Um, so what, okay, let me stop you there. So what aspect of Winston Churchill? Oh, well, well, because Winston, so, so I, just to fill in the picture a bit, I'm politically conservative, and this is unusual in Canada. Yes. Canada is a left of center country. It's actually moving a little more to the right. But, uh, and I, I, of course, was left wing in my youth and was involved in some, what you might in retrospect call radical student politics, the youth, and then uh, kind of had this epiphany based on reading when I was in my early 20s while I was in medical school. And I've been on the right ever since. So, I, you know, I'm well used to. Uh, being considered a contrarian, you know, right-wing reactionary, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and the, the appealing thing about Churchill is not not that he was right or left, but that he was a contrarian who, when when the rest of England was solidly behind appeasement, saw the danger sure. of German uh, rearmaments and. It really was a lone voice of reason and succeeded and then of course uh, brought brought England around to his way of thinking and led England through its darkest times sure. so you know <clears throat> that was and and not only did he do that but the result was obviously the you know what you might consider the salvation of the free world uh, and so, you know, he's, he's certainly an extraordinary individual. Many flaws, of course. Um, Any other heroes? Of, uh, well, I, I kind of have what you, what you might call uh, intellectual icons who are, right. who are guys who are like uh, uh, political philosophers. Uh, so there's a guy named Leo Strauss, who's not that well known, but who worked at the University of Chicago and influenced a whole generation of political philosophers and teachers, of whom one is Alan Bloom, who's better known, who wrote the, the, um, the uh, Decline of the American Mind, I believe it's called. And, and, and these guys, influ I have a lot of uh, friends in, who are poli in political philosophy who were really influenced by these two guys. And, and um, uh, I guess, uh, so, so in terms of my kind of intellectual perspective on life, it, it's derived from those guys. I don't know if I'd call them heroes. Right. But maybe <laughs> kind of intellectual mentors. Um, so what about urological heroes? Well, so I, I, of course, am a product of Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is really where I got my uh, my uh, training and my more advanced training and certainly perspective on life. So Whitmore was really one of my, my, my main exemplar. He was also a guy who tried to live a balanced life, also a guy who who was really widely loved, even though he was in an environment that was very kind of politicized. He was, you know, deeply committed to the scientific endeavor, could talk to scientists. And he was also, I think, who really recognized, <clears throat> probably my main debt to him, was he, he, he recognized, communicated the importance of what you could call surgical humility. Yes, that is yes. recognizing the limits of intervention. You know, it's famous phrase: uh, um, "If cure is cure necessary when it's possible, and possible when it's necessary." It's evoked this this sense that you know the outcome of disease is mostly determined by biology, not intervention. So that's widely accepted now. But at the time, this was—I I certainly had no hint of that in my residency training. 
and it was like a revelation. Right. And and, and it was a once I left Memorial and came back into practice, there were in terms of the whole surveillance story, there were some publications out there. Um, one by Johansson and one by a guy named George, which has largely been forgotten, that reported extremely low rates of mortality with watchful waiting without any, any intervention at all. And it was a, a very short step from that to say, you know, maybe we can, maybe there's a middle ground where we can watch these patients initially and intervene over time. And uh, my, we came up with that as a project from my multidisciplinary group, which uh, I was the chair of. This is sort of, I'd been back maybe five years. And we got a, we applied for a grant from a brand new foundation called the Prostate Cancer Research Foundation of Canada. And they gave us their first grant, which was for $35,000, to set up a prospective study of this really what was considered a radical approach. And, you know, the rest kind of history it grew from there. And so <clears throat> what I'm hearing there is that deep inside Whitmore was uh, somebody who, I mean, his other statements, were, uh, most people die with prostate yes. cancer and all that. It does land into that, uh, that concept of active surveillance, yes, doesn't it? Yes, for yeah. sure. And he also said, of course, more people make a living from prostate yeah. cancer than die from yeah, prostate yeah, cancer. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, yeah. there's many... Yeah. He, he was... Uh, fairly clear-eyed about yeah. the whole situation. And, yeah. um, of course, he did die of prostate cancer. And, yes. You know, many ironies there. But, um, yeah, it was... The, the emphasis of Memorial then that was so great was an, em was an emphasis on cancer biology <clears throat> as the major determinant of outcome and the importance of really understanding it. The other, the other really special thing about my time there was that I never once in two years felt that uh, financial considerations had any role in the decision making. And it was never mentioned, it never intruded, and that, that really was exceptional. Yeah. Uh, and then of course, you know, phenomenal kind of collaboration but with science, between the scientists and the clinicians in that institution. They really they really had something special in that era. And, and they still have, And they I still think. do, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's quite remarkable. So, here we are. Where are we going in the future? Where, where, where are we going to see ourselves in, say, 15 years? You are talking about urology as a specialty? I'm talking about you. Oh, well, um, so I'm one, I love what I do. I think we are, you know, we're incredibly fortunate to do the kind of work where we actually, you know, work with our hands, make things, change people's lives, but also as a clinician scientist, you know, have the opportunity, have that kind of intellectual stimulation. It, it is just a gorgeous combination of, um, you know, practical application and uh, intellectual pursuit. And I want to keep doing it as long as I can. So uh, I, you know, people, I'm just reaching the age where people think they can ask me if I have any retirement plans without being <laughs> offensive to me, although I still find it offensive. But I mean, I, I, I hope to keep going, uh, you know, for uh, really uh, as long as possible, as right. long as health uh, permits. And, you know, I... I um, I have research laboratory, clinical trials consortium that I run, uh, a lot of activities kind of outside of strict yep. clinical practice that I hope to be able to continue, you know, as long yep. as possible. I'm, <coughs> as, you, as you well know, the last thing in the world I would ever want to do is offend you. Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> but I... So, <clears throat> I didn't actually put it in the, what are you going to do when you retire? No, I didn't put uh, it like that. So, but you have answered the question. Well, no, but I mean, I, I you know, I, yes, I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll I, the, uh, the idea of being sidelined is not appealing to no. me. So, I think, no, I mean, eventually everyone slows down. Uh, eventually, there may also come a time when, you know, you lose your art and then for the patient's good, you right. need to stop. So I'm not interested in at all even approaching that point. 
But uh, I think, you know, life is rich. I mean, um, uh, music, sports, people, uh, no, that's travel, great. and so on. Uh, uh, the, the, the one thing, I, I, Kevin, which I, I want to ask him about just before we let him go. No, we got time. Is um, which you can put back in the thing because I forgot you're an editor. Yes. And um, on top of everything, I, mean, I know. Wouldn't want to leave that out. No, I don't. I don't want to leave it out because we, we are we are the competition rapidly gaining on your uh, your impact factor, but. <laughs> Well, I think it's always. No, no, I, I'm I, think it's, I, I, I think it's always easier for a small journal to do that. So it's <laughs> <laughs> so back in your back no, in no, your place, go ahead. boy. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, it's fine. So I, I know only too well how much being an editor yeah. impinges on your your, yeah. your life. So tell us about being a, a editor of the Canadian Journal. It, it's um, yeah. So um, so this was an initiative. I, I started. The story is a little bit complex. Uh, approximately almost 20 years ago, uh, there, there was an opportunity to start a Canadian Journal of Urology. It didn't exist. And I met a small-time medical publisher and started talking to him about this. And it, there was certainly uh, resources there in terms of advertising revenue. So we started the Canadian Journal of Urology. And it was a big success. And within a couple of years, we, I was the founding editor. Within a couple of years, we uh, became the official journal of the Canadian Urology Association. And I did that for uh, about 13 years. And the journal became indexed, more robust. And then the CUA, Canadian Urology Association, decided they'd like to own that journal. They entered into negotiations with the publisher, which broke down. And so the, the CUA said, fine, we're going to go our own way. And I, of course, very involved with the CUA. So I threw my lot in with them, left the CJU. We started the CUAJ. The two Canadian journals created a lot of confusion. But there are, and, and I became the editor of the new one, the CUAJ, which I still am. So, so I've been editing the Canadian journal for uh, 16 or 17 years. And uh, now we have an associate editor, Rob Siemens, who will probably know, Rob, yeah. step into the editorship. From, from Kingston. Yeah maybe, yeah, maybe I shouldn't say that. We have an associate editor, and I, I, I intend to not, not carry on a whole lot longer. Uh, but uh, so it's, it's been a, <clears throat> a fantastic journey in terms of building this thing. Uh, and, you know, through a number of hurdles, uh, and it's done a lot for Canadian urology. Uh, it's, it's ramped up the, the publication record of, uh, we, we had a problem in Canada of very uh, uh, unpublished abstracts, was a very common yeah. phenomenon, right. never made it into print. Uh, and you know, we, we've, we've uh, we focused on, on Canadian issues, Canadian guidelines, and then uh, scientific research going on in Canada and elsewhere in the world. Uh, so I think it's been a it's been a very strong initiative, and it, and it will continue going forward. It would be better if there was only one Canadian journal. And I'm not quite sure how that's going to pan out. It's uh, somewhat of a I would say of an embarrassment that the the, the editor of the CJU, the first journal, is American, is an American yeah. and we would like to see that situation changed. Right. Well, listen, Laurie, thank you very much indeed. All right. I, I have very much enjoyed talking to All you. All right. And, uh